Adventure is a program through Mennonite Mission Network. It's a 10-month program. Um, there's different units, uh, places you can go around the country through Service Adventure. Uh, Anchorage, Alaska, Colorado Springs, Colorado, Albuquerque, New Mexico, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and the newest one just opened this year in Jackson, Mississippi. Um, the way the units kind of work is that there are three to six participants living in a unit and each participant gets placed at a nonprofit in that town. Um, and then there's also a couple of unit leaders, uh, somebody to kind of help the people along who are participants. Sometimes they're a little bit more needed than others. I think we could have probably been all right without unit leaders, but it was still great to have them. Um, yeah. All right, so this is our Colorado Springs unit. Um, how many of you all were here when we were able to come visit with you guys and share in church? Awesome. So some of you may recognize these faces already. Um, me here on the end, and then Anna right next to me. She is from Radebeul, Germany. Uh, Franzi is from Hoibach, Germany. Uh, Anna Lee is from uh, Raleigh, North Carolina. And then our unit leaders on the end are Meg and Daniel Smelter Miller, and they are originally from Harrisonburg, Virginia. Um, and right over there, that's our little house in Colorado Springs that we lived in. Um, it was at, it was really cute, it was in a little um, res residential area in Colorado Springs, but it was close enough to downtown that most of us could bike to work, um, pretty centralized location. So that was great. All right. Uh, before I get into what I did during the year, uh, I'm going to go over all the other participants' workplaces as well, so you all can kind of get um, a general idea of the, all of the options available. Uh, up here we have Franzi, and she worked for Our House Bright Futures, which is a day center for young adults with disabilities. Uh, basically what she did there was um, they had her placed with uh, two to three students per day, um, and what they did is they just kind of hung out all the time. Um, they went out into the community and did some service work with the students. They would go out to eat. They would go out to shop. Um, they would get to go on really fun field trips out to like Garden of the Gods. And they even went to Trampoline World like every other Friday. Um, so we always joked that Francie never actually had to work. She just got to go and have fun. Um, so we were all... We were all sometimes a little jealous of her job. Um, and then Anna, on the far side, is working at Westside Community Center in the preschool. Uh, pretty straightforward, it's a preschool. Uh, but she was basically just a you know, teacher aide to help keep the kids under control a little bit. Um, for those of you who have worked in education, I'm sure you understand the need for that. Um, but it was a very good job placement for her because she is actually looking at um, doing, uh, working in elementary education uh, for her job. So she's starting college for that in October. All right, uh, and the next place is Seeds Community Cafe. This is where Annalee worked. Um, and I'll try to explain this the best I can, but it's a bit of a different concept. So it's a little confusing. Uh, this is a pay what you can cafe. Uh, this does not mean it's a soup kitchen or the food is free, um, you pay literally what you can. So they have the menu um, and instead of having set prices after you order, they ask how much uh, would you like to donate today. Uh, baseline costs for wages and food come out to about four to five dollars, so they always tell you that. You can pay that or you can pay twenty dollars for a meal if you like the um, idea of it, but if you can't pay um, for those who may be in a tough financial situation, um, you can actually volunteer for an hour and get your meal for free, uh, which I thought was a really cool idea. Um, and it kind of creates a pretty awesome dynamic because you've got people who you know, may be in a homeless situation who come in, um, they don't want to go to the soup kitchen, so they come in and volunteer for an hour, um, and they that's how they pay for their meal. And they could be sitting right next to some rich businessman who came in and paid $50 for his meal because he just wanted to make a donation to the cause. Um, and I thought that was 
really cool. Uh, another great thing about SEEDS is they partner with Colorado Springs Food Rescue, uh, which is an organization that aims to eliminate food waste in Colorado Springs. Uh, if you look at their website, you see some pretty crazy stats about um, how much of our food is wasted, especially our fresh food. Um, up to 40% of the food produced is wasted, which is very tragic. Uh, and so what they do is they collect food donations, um, especially fresh food um, from grocery stores around the area. And then they distribute those to places around the community like food pantries or homeless shelters, um, and that way people who may not otherwise have access to fresh food can have it. Um, and they also then partner with seeds, so a lot of the um, food that you're eating there might have been thrown away if you weren't there eating it. Um, and I think it's a great way to eliminate waste. Uh, seeds is a really cool place to go. If I would not have worked at Family Promise, uh, where I worked, I would definitely have wanted to work at Seeds. All right, so as I mentioned, I was working at Family Promise of Colorado Springs, which is a transitional shelter for homeless families. Uh, before I really get into what I did there, I wanted to show you guys some stats um, about homelessness in Colorado Springs, uh, simply because going into it, I had no idea what the situation was, what we were really working with. Um, and so there's some very eye-opening things here. Uh, according to the 2016 Point in Time Survey for Colorado Springs, on May 1, 2016, 1,219 total individuals were counted as homeless in El Paso County. Now, that's too big of a number to start out with, but um, it's actually probably much lower um, than the total number of those that are homeless, in a homeless situation. Uh, the way the point in time survey works, I actually helped participate in that this year. Uh, anyone who calls in for resources on that day is asked to complete a short five minute survey. So you've got the people who don't, who refuse to do the survey and that would add to this number. Um, as well as the people who um, just haven't called in for resources that day for whatever reason. They don't have access to a phone. So that total number is much higher than that. Um, and of those surveyed, 269 of them were completely unsheltered. Um, there's never any room in the shelters. Uh, if we can't accept somebody into the program, it was so hard because you had no idea where to tell them to go next because there, everything was full. There was nowhere to go. Um, another thing that shocks me and saddens me quite a bit um, is the next one. In the 2012-2013 school year, 2,564 students in the Colorado Springs School District experienced homelessness at some point. Um, and that kind of makes you want to cry because they, it's these kids that should not have to be worried um, about where they're going to stay. They should be worried about school and being a kid. Um, and so that's why Family Promise really works with families. Um, and helping kids. Uh, and then this last one is something that was also very shocking to me. Uh, the Colorado Springs Housing Authority waitlist for affordable housing through their Section 8 program numbers 2,583 people. Uh, there is no affordable housing. Uh, they actually had to shut down this waitlist about a year ago because it just got too long. There were so many people. Um, and during the entire time I was in Colorado Springs, they opened back up the wait list for one 24-hour period. So I think this kind of paints a picture of the need um, excuse me, for affordable housing. Okay. Um, and so this is where I worked at Family Promise. Uh, we do transitional shelter for families who are in a homeless situation. Um, the way it works is we partner with different churches around the community. And each week, a different church would take a turn hosting the families that are in our program. Uh, during the day, the families stay at a centralized day house, and that's kind of home base for them. That's where they have their closets, most of their belongings. Um, but the house is not big enough for all the families. We do four families at a time, and it was like a three-bedroom house. So they can't all stay there for the night. Um, and so whatever church is hosting that week um, provides 
beds for them, usually in Sunday school classrooms. Um, each family gets their own room, which was really great because in most of the shelters, um, the men were separated from the women and children, so it was very hard to keep families together. Uh, volunteers at the churches would provide meals for the families and child care for the kids in the evening so the parents could get a little bit of a break and just chill out for a while. Um, and you can kind of see here, um, we've got a picture of Anneli, my housemate. Uh, when we, when our church in Colorado Springs hosted, we would always go over there and help. Um, and that's a really cute picture of Anneli with a little girl named Amila. Um, during their time in the program, families are um, motivated towards self-sufficiency. Uh, we didn't give them, it wasn't handouts. Um, families really <coughs> had to work hard to pull themselves out of their situation. Uh, through case management, um, a lot of things that they worked on were just um, like resume building if they didn't have jobs, job search if they needed jobs. Um, and a big thing was budgeting. Um, a lot of families had the resources they needed, they just needed a little bit of guidance to kind of get them where they needed to go. Um, it was a 90 day program, pretty short. Um, and that's why, uh, one thing I really want to point out here is that we worked with situationally homeless families. Um, there's such a difference between those who, you know, might be living paycheck to paycheck, somebody loses their job, and then they can't afford rent, so they don't have a home. Um, or they might have a big medical expense that comes up, and they end up without a home. Uh, there's a huge difference between that and then the kind of, a person that pops up in your mind when you think of somebody who is homeless, um, which would be chronic homelessness. Maybe they like literally have lived on the streets for the past year. Um, and that's a whole different thing because the mindset is completely different. Uh, for those who are chronically homeless, the idea is to spend your money while you have it. Uh, which to those of us who are not in that mindset seems completely unreasonable. Um, but for those people, it takes such a complete mind change, uh, change of mentality um, to help pull themselves out of their situation. Uh, so we mainly tried to work with families who were just situationally homeless um, and could get back on their feet in the 90 days that our program was meant to be. Um, here, what I did was, this was my morning job. Um, I worked in the office and I was mostly doing um, phone calls. So what I would do is anyone who called in and wanted information about the program, um, I would give that out. Anyone who wanted to apply for the program, I did their initial interview over the phone, which usually ended up being 20 to 30 minutes, depending on how much of their life story they wanted to tell you. Um, and I was also doing just other stuff around. I helped with. Uh, mailings and um, just other stuff that needed to be done. Um, and then in the afternoon I went over to the Family Day Center which was a partnership between Family Promise of Colorado Springs and Catholic Charities of Central Colorado. Um, so it was located in Catholic Charities Marion House. Uh, it's very new to Colorado Springs. It actually didn't open up until September 3rd of last year. So um, I was there helping out before it opened and started working there as soon as it opened. Um, we stress that it's not a shelter, it's a resource center for families in need, uh, people who maybe don't have housing or maybe have unstable housing. Uh, we offered case management there was the big thing, um, as well as they had a computer lab for those who needed to work on um, job search or resume. And we had a big family room where people who um, you know, might be out on the streets could just come in, hang out, get out of the weather, hot or cold, whatever it was outside. Um, a big area for the kids to play. Um, and we also provided child watch for families who, uh, if mom and dad were working, um, the kids could just play and not bother the parents. Uh, um, I chose this picture because it was uh, the story behind this family is really cool. So the older woman on the right for you guys um, is one of our volunteers, Daryl Lynn. And then the little girl, her name is Juliana. And her family, um, her dad was a veteran and 
he ended up losing his job and the Veterans Association um, usually helps out in that kind of situation but they were having a lot of problems working with them and ended up in a homeless situation. Uh, so they came in, worked with our case managers, um, and within a week or two were able to um, find housing through another program. And it was just such, it was so amazing to see when you have families that come in and are really struggling, but they're working so hard and you just, you're rooting for them and you want them to be successful so bad and to see them um, get what they need was just, it's, it's an amazing feeling. Right, uh, so now that I've kind of gone over all of our jobs and what we did while we were there, um, I want to go over a couple of other things that pop into my mind when I think of service adventure. Uh, the first one being learning components and it's pretty straightforward. Um, learning new things. Once a week uh, we would all take turns, the six of us in our unit, planning um, a learning component on a new thing. This could be something that we knew how to do. We could invite in somebody that we knew from our church or from the community um, to teach us something new. Um, or it could be something that we ourselves wanted to learn and just kind of wanted to try it out as a group. So some good examples um, of things that we did. Um, we learned how to bake bread. That was my favorite by far. I love making bread now. Um, we also did a lot of ones over sports because Daniel and I were the big sports fans and nobody else knew anything about it. So um, I did, you know, we did ones over football and basketball and fun stuff like that. Uh, we also did stuff, a lot of things over other religions, um, which I thought was very important and very eye-opening to me. I think that there's a lot of things that we can learn from other religions. Um, another thing that we did every week was worship nights. Uh, same thing, just kind of like a Bible study, worship evening. We all took turns planning it, just as we did um, with learning components. And it was very cool to see the different kinds of worship that came out um, when all these other people planned it. So we'd have some that were just regular Bible studies. We'd read out of the Bible um, and have discussion. There would be times where we would watch movies and discuss. Um, and my personal favorite ones were the ones where we just sat around singing. It was wonderful. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to go over was all the outside volunteering that we did. Uh, apart from our jobs, there were many times where we would go out into the community and do other volunteering. Uh, the picture that we have here of Anna is from uh, during Halloween at our church. They had a big Halloween party for the kids with tons of games and prizes and um, they got really excited about it. And so we went out to help with that. Uh, we also got to go, my favorite was going out to Rocky Mountain Mennonite Camp. Um, we went out there, it was only about an hour drive, so we went out there quite a bit, but we got to volunteer at all of their snow camps, um, which was super awesome. We got to spend the weekend up in the mountains. Uh, we did have to do some cleaning, but it didn't feel like much work because we got to hang out and have fun and usually got to listen to the speakers that were up there as well, um, which is really great. All right. I also wanted to go over our host church there in Colorado Springs. Um, at each unit they have one or in the case of Johnstown, like eight churches that support the service adventure units. Um, and since there is one Mennonite church in Colorado Springs, that was the one that was our host congregation, uh, Bethel Mennonite, they are around 180 on their average attendance, so slightly bigger than here, but not, it wasn't, it didn't feel crazy big and overwhelming. Um, their worship style was a little bit more contemporary probably than what we would be used to here, but it was very, it was a very comfortable setting. Um, one thing that was really great about Bethel and something that I think all churches should uh, strive to achieve was the diversity, um, especially in political views. You had ultra, ultra conservative people mixed with ultra, ultra hippie liberal people and they all came together to worship God. Um, and I think that that's so amazing when people can just set their differences aside um, and come together to worship God. Uh, in the corner over here, we've got uh, my and Franzi's Sunday school class. We were asked to teach the three to five-year-olds uh, for the year, which 
proved to be an experience some of the time. Um, we love those kids. They're so much fun, so much energy, and that's just a great age. They'll say anything. They get excited about everything. Um, and we had a really great time teaching. Uh, the other thing that's kind of associated with our church that I wanted to talk about today was raw tools. Ha has anybody heard of raw tools or what that is? You've read about it? Yeah. So it's, very, it's a very new thing, uh, but something that I think is really amazing. Uh, a guy from Bethel, Mike Martin, decided that he, he had this idea and he wanted to start it up. This was just a couple years ago. Uh, and the idea behind this organization is that they take guns and they turn them into garden tools. So it's the whole swords to plowshares idea. It's really amazing. Um, we actually got to help with a fundraiser that they had where Shane Claiborne came to speak. Um, and it was just a really powerful thing. I think it's um, guns into garden tools is a very powerful um, description of peace. And that was something that I thought was amazing and it meant a lot to me. Um, Mike actually came and did a learning component with us and he said that there are so many people interested in buying the garden tools that they don't have enough guns to like, that are donated to supply what they need to make the garden tools, which I thought was really cool as well. All right, and then this uh, represents something that I talked about when we were here um, as a group presenting, and that's the simplicity aspect of Sarah's adventure. Um, you have to live simply. It's not a choice because we're all doing volunteer work and we're not making much money. So you can't afford to do things like go out to eat all the time or buy a ton of new clothes. Um, we did simplicity challenges as well that pushed us even further. Um, you know, taking shorter showers, um, not using the vehicle at all, which was really hard, um, and things like that. And while that sounds very not fun, um, I felt so much more whole with my life. Um, and I've been trying to find ways, in Service Adventure that was just how we lived, it was how we were because that's that's the lifestyle you choose. But then going into college and going into quote unquote real life, um, where I could choose to live less simply, um, I've been trying really hard to find ways to keep that feeling of living simply and having a more wholesome life. So I really like the first one here. And this is something that I would challenge all of you guys to do as well. Uh, less TV, more reading, less shopping, more outdoors, less clutter with more space, less rush with more slowness, less consuming with more creating, less junk and more real food, less busy work with more impact, less driving, more walking, less noise and more solitude, less focus on the future and more on the present, Less work with more play, less worry with more smiles, and as always, do not forget to breathe. Uh, so I've been trying to see that and live that, um, and I would encourage you to do the same as well. Um, a big part of this as well was that we, we got $40 a month for our stipends. That was our spending money. So we did not go out and buy a lot of things. Um, in a culture that tells us that we have to buy a lot of things, um, it's kind of like a rebellious concept. You can be happy with all of this stuff. Uh, the ads lie, the anxiety in your soul will not be settled by anything that you can buy in a store. Um, and that's something that I've truly grown to believe. All right. So next I just kind of want to go over, service adventure has a lot of different aspects and I've gone over our work and um, our outside activities and now I just kind of want to go over some fun things that we got to do because it was not all work and no play. So this first picture was from when we went to the Olympic Training Center in Colorado Springs, um, 10 minute drive from where we live. But we thought that it would be really cute to pose um, in front of the nice big statue. 
So Franzi is a nice dancer, Anna is a volleyball player, Annalise kicking a soccer ball, uh, Meg and I, I think, are trying to be weightlifters, and Daniel is losing, which I thought was funny. <laughs> uh, next we have our Pikes Peak trip here. Uh, every year, um, the people who are not a part of our unit, the girl in the pink jacket, uh, Leah and the guy in the bright yellow, Joe, uh, they take every unit on a hike up Pikes Peak. Uh, we did this like two and a half weeks after we got to Colorado Springs. And some people I know, for those of you who've been up to like family camp or Rocky Mountain, there are people that will do it after only being in altitude for like a week. I don't know how they survived. <laughs> um, we were dying. It was. <laughs> I, oh my goodness, that was one of the hardest things I've done in my life, but it's so cool um, to say, it's, it's one of those things that now I can say I've done it, I've hiked Pikes Peak. Uh, a funny story about that was that uh, Joe and Leah, they've taken every group since the unit started six years ago, and we had asked them, okay, how long do you think that this is going to take? How long, when should we expect to be back? And they said, well, you know, most of the other groups get down mid-afternoon. And so we, you know, we hike, we get up to the top, it's like this amazing view, it extends, you can see for forever. Um, one thing I will say though, once you hike it, you really grow to resent the people that come up on the train. <laughs> like, that's not fair. <laughs> they did not work for it. <laughs> but um, we hiked up and uh, as we started going back down, we realized like how late it was and we went to the, all the way to the bottom and it was like 5.30 and we were like, this sucks. We feel like we've gone so hard, we've done so well, but we're still like later than the rest of the groups. And Joe was like, oh, well that's because the rest of the groups drove halfway down the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> we were like, well why didn't you tell us that was an option? <laughs> so um, we felt pretty proud of ourselves as the first group so far to actually go all the way up and all the way down. All right, this next picture is from the Albuquerque International Balloon Fiesta. Uh, as you may remember, the Albuquerque I unit is there in Albuquerque, and we stayed with them. Uh, during that time, we got to go see the Balloon Fiesta, which was an amazing experience. It's definitely one of those one-of-a-kind things that you don't get to do. Like, there's nowhere else you can do it, so it's really cool to say that you've been there. And it was also really awesome to meet the other unit and see their friendships and their dynamics and make friends with them there as well. All right, so these next couple are from the end of our year trip. Uh, each unit gets to save up during the year um, and take a trip at the end of their term. So we chose to go to Yellowstone National Park and also the Grand Tetons. Um, so this is just a really cool picture from one of the um, steam pots there. Um, <laughs> this next one is of Annalie pointing at a buffalo from a very safe distance. <laughs> yeah, and there's a, a picture from the Tetons. We were lucky enough to be able to go hike there. Beautiful place. One of my favorite places to visit, so I was really happy we could uh, spend this, it was it was very relieving to kind of have some time after we stopped our jobs and stopped. Um, we knew service adventure was going to come to an end, so it was really great to have this time to kind of decompress and think about the year, reflect on the year. We had many conversations about how life would be different when you go home, some of the frustrations and some of the joys you would have. Um, from that transition, uh, some of the frustrations we had and joys we had during the year we looked back on um, and it was really just a great time to be together yet before we all went our separate ways. Right. So that's the end. Before I want to, before I open it up for questions, I want to just kind of finish by saying that Service Adventure was by far like the best year of my life. I feel like I grew so much as a person. Uh, I've learned how to communicate better because I had to talk on the phone for my job 
I've, I used to be so scared of talking on the phone, and that's something I got thrown into, and I now know how to do. Um, I also, you learn also to communicate because you're living in this house with five people that you've never met before, and everyone grows up differently. Everyone has different ways of getting along and talking with each other, and so you learn to work with people who might not have the same views as you. Um, I also feel like long-term service, um, you know, six months to however long you decide it to be, is one of the best things that you can do. I think everybody at some point in their life should do some long-term service because it's such, um, it's good for the place you work at to be able to have somebody there who's a little bit longer term, more than a couple of weeks. Um, but it's good for, it felt so good for me as a person. Uh, I felt so fulfilled and so whole um, this past year. And so what I've been doing is just looking for ways to um, keep serving and keep having that um, feeling of a wholesome, fulfilled life. Um, so yeah, thank you guys for coming to hear me talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions? <coughs> Think you got forty dollars a month. Who bought your food for the rest of the month? Yeah, gotcha. So um, forty dollars. The question was about um, how we paid for things. We only got forty dollars a month. Forty dollars a month was our spending money for each person. Uh, we had a separate food budget, but that that's another thing. Our food budget was twenty dollars per person per week, uh, which is. I, I don't know what everyone else is used to, but we spend a lot more than $20 per person per week in our household for groceries. Um, so that was something that we really had to um, learn how to cook with not a ton of money. Um, and that money came from our unit budget, and our unit budget was provided by a lot of different sources from the church, from Mennonite Mission Network. Um, and from other donations and as well as some of our um, workplaces were able to give us small stipends um, like nowhere near minimum wage or anything like that but just to help pay for rent and food and things like that in the uh, in your particular place that you work who subsidized that I mean where who is sponsoring that and, and paying for all the things that went into your day. Yeah, gotcha. So uh, the question was where I worked, who was who was paying for all that, who was subsidizing that. Uh, Family Promise is gets funding from many different sources, a uh, big one being grants. Um, they had our executive director was basically full-time grant writer as well. Um, we got also a ton of donations from the churches. Uh, it was a very vast expanse of churches that were supporting us, I believe. Oh my goodness. It was like 40-something churches around the community were supporting us in some way, whether that was actually being host churches and hosting the families in their facilities, or if it was supporting where they would you know, maybe bring out a meal for one of the nights to the other churches that the families, families were staying at. Um, or just supporting financially. Uh, so we had a pretty big backing from the churches around the community, um, and a lot of funding came from them as well. Yeah. Did your host church own the house, and then the unit leaders were there for a year, or are they there longer? Okay, so um, our house is actually rented. The church does not own it, um, and luckily we rent from a pretty cool person who keeps our rent very low because they like the idea of service adventure. Um, rent in Colorado Springs keeps going up and they've um, kept our rent at the same rate as it was when we uh, moved in there. Uh, the unit leaders actually have a two-year term and they can opt for a third. So Megan Daniel actually got new participants about two weeks ago um, and they're beginning their new year. When you have a budget like that on food, I know we all go grocery shopping. Who, how do you go about planning to make that stretch for as far as it has to? Gotcha. All right, so the question is, when you have such a small grocery budget, how do you go about planning that? How do you make that last? 
Um, with the way we did chores, we each signed up for a meal. So we would plan, we, we did meal planning for every week. We planned out what we needed. Um, and it was usually, um, it was really great because Meg was super into like, make it like she did not like it when we bought canned beans because we could get dry beans and make those and that would be cheaper and so it was great to have somebody that like had that view and had that experience because she knew how to cook for so cheap um, and she taught us kind of how to cook um, with for for very little money um, we didn't really ever so Meg and Daniel were vegetarian, and at first we were all like, um, that's not going to work. <laughs> but pretty soon we figured out how easy it is to cook without meat. There's tons of things you can make, and that made everything a lot easier because um, meat can get expensive if you're trying to cook it for six people. At Family Promise, you, you did the initial screenings of people. Talk about what that screening was and what the qualifications had to be for, for families to be part of the group. All right. Uh, so the question was about family promise and um, like after the initial screening, what were the qualifications? What were um, what did the families need to do to become a part of the program? Um, there were certain baseline rules of things that were just like no goes. Like because it was a communal living situation. We couldn't have anyone who had had um, domestic violence, child abuse, or assault charges. So anyone who called in and said that they had that on their record, we automatically had to refer them out to another agency because we couldn't take that. Um, there was kind of, the, the form had many different questions on it from how many kids you have to education level to debt information. Um, and based on that information, there was kind of a ranking system. Each thing had a certain amount of points. And what you wanted to do was have the least amount of points possible. Um, and that kind of gave us a picture of what families would be able to be successful in the program um, and what families needed some more longer term support than what we could provide for them. Um, but, you know. You can, uh, like the numbers sometimes lie in that situation. We would bring in families who maybe had a higher score, um, but just you know seem to really want it and seem to really want to work hard and be successful. So that it, it kind of gave us an idea, but we often ended up taking families to just come in and talk to the case manager, talk to the staff, um, and that way we could get a good idea of um, what they would be like in the program. How big a city is Colorado Springs? Uh, Colorado Springs is around half a million people, but it is growing very quickly. How different do you feel as a person when you look at your life now as opposed to a year ago before you did this? Um, how was it? I know, I know you shared it was a kind of growth for you, but do you do you feel like? A lot of your perspective has changed, or just you experienced things you didn't know about before. What, how, what was the Yeah, so the question kind of was just how I've changed. How am I different from a year ago? How has my perspective changed? And that's a really good question. I feel, I really do feel like I'm a different person because of this. Um, I have, I think it caused me to kind of grow up. A little bit not that I was not a mature person beforehand but you know you go out into like the real world away from mom and dad and away from this little city called Inman Kansas where you've lived in the same house for 18 years and everything's the same and you go out into the city that you've been to before in my case but it's very different experience living there and you're working at this job that deals with like real life scary situations. Um, I know that I would never end up in a homeless situation because I know that if I needed it, I have family there for me, but a lot of people don't have that. Um, and so that, you know, going into that and seeing people who have um, worked so hard but still don't have what they need is kind of like a slap in the face. Uh, the real world hits you pretty quickly. So. 
Um, coming from that, I feel like I've, you know, you keep that in mind. You carry that with you when you learn about it. Um, there, I've, I've changed in other ways as well. I feel like I'm, like I mentioned earlier, a more effective communicator. Um, you learn, uh, I think the household situation uh, was what mainly did it. You, you have to learn to get along with the people you're living with. Whether you like them or not, you are stuck with them for 10 months, and so you might as well make it enjoyable and not awful. Um, so you learn to work with people who might be very different than you. Luckily, we didn't have too much of a problem with that. We all got along pretty well, but you know, there's always times when you live with somebody for a long time, you're probably going to fight. Um, and, <laughs> and also, as I said before, um, I, got, I definitely got a new perspective on uh, simplicity, and I became a lot more like Mennonite, I feel like, in that way, <laughs> because um, that was... Well, um, it just wasn't as big of a thing growing up as it was in Service Adventure, um, because it had to be in Service Adventure, but um, I learned through that um, how, how great of a lifestyle living simply is, um, and how it has such a, a big thing for me was how 